So Rick, a couple of weeks ago, Eric, Eric, a couple of weeks ago, I met someone who said, you're a minister? I said, yeah, I am. She said, you're too young to be a minister. <laughs> I'm in my 60th year. <laughs> So this is a difficult time for mainstream denominations. Most of our churches are shrinking in resources and in numbers while our building costs are rising. We're tempted to move into survival mode, which usually sounds the death knell. Grief and fear of further loss becomes the driving emotion and our usual tolerance for disagreements and dislike is beginning to wear thin. When we focus on loss, we seek to problem solve by identifying the source and eliminating the problem. When new people come into the church, they hear blaming, scapegoating, a pining for the good old days, and a deep sadness of loss. Not the most enticing of messages a new person would want to hear. So what would happen if a congregation resists a focus on the negative, resists what's called deficit thinking, and instead directs its energy into an assessment of its strengths and abilities through what is called appreciative inquiry? This assessment's not pie in the sky, head in the sand, glory, but rather is realistically optimistic, based on an honest assessment of our current assets. So, in other words, what are our collective gifts, abilities, strengths, passions, resources, nudgings of God? Where is the Spirit moving in our midst? Can we dare to imagine God's endless possibilities that could happen right now through us, just as we are, not as we want to be, not as we wish we were? How can we be Christ's hands and feet with the people and resources that we currently have? And I think that's part of what Eric was asking us earlier. I have found the key to these questions is to expand our understanding of we. Who are we? Is our congregation a fortress that lowers the drawbridge to newcomers only to raise it when other churches come and ask us to advertise and support their programs? Newcomers, I have found, are usually coming from other congregations. And so we may feel a tinge of guilt about sheep stealing, but what the heck, we'll take what we can get. But what if we see other congregations, other denominations, even other faith groups, not as competitors for the few seekers that are there, but as partners in God's mission that is so much bigger than any of us? When I began to work at uh, the current congregation I serve at Westworth United Church, I was looking forward to the good number of children of congregants, of the amount of givings. It was the largest congregation I've ever served with the newest building, best maintained building. But I was puzzled because when I arrived, I found a common sentiment that we were dying. It was slowly decreasing in numbers and in givings, but it was also meeting its budget and still is with a small deficit or small surplus each year and very active in, in many ministries. But it seemed to be focused on what it was no more. Then three opportunities for partnership came our way. Near the end of my first year at Westworth, a friend approached me and asked if Westworth would be able to sponsor three Syrian families of 24 people. I think I laughed. <laughs> Serendipitously, um, we were having a congregational meeting to determine outreach priorities that same week. And so our co-chairs of the outreach committee threw this idea into the mix. And to our surprise, the congregation embraced it rather enthusiastically. It then went to the board, 
who embraced it a little less enthusiastically. It, it, it required $120,000, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the board said, if you can find outside partners who will provide volunteers, and if you can find a guarantee that this money can be met from outside the congregation, we'll consider it. This was, the, this was in May. Um, it, in May, you're looking towards summer and summer holidays. And so we thought, well, it's probably not going to happen. But we began calling near the end of June into July, when almost everyone's gone. And we were stunned at the response we found. By the end of July, we were able to call a special board meeting to sign the refugee application because we had found so many partners who had pledged enough money, donated goods, and volunteers. At the same time, our congregation had begun holding interfaith Lenten studies with the help of the United Church grant. The first year, we offered a five-week dialogue between Indigenous teaching and Christianity. The second year, in conjunction with our sponsorship of these families that had then arrived, we um, offered a uh, dialogue between Islam and Christianity. The third year, between Buddhism and Christianity, um, Judaism and Christianity, and the fourth year Buddhism. We were surprised at the attendance each year from various denominations and faith traditions across the city. And so it seemed as if we tapped into a hunger for faith traditions to engage with one another. And then out of these dialogues, we were able to develop some trusting relationships that allowed us to do some partnering with, with uh, sponsoring, for instance, the Winnipeg Diversity Rally Against Hate and many op other opportunities that have come up. We're beginning to hear uh, Muslim and Jewish communities say to the church that this is a place where we can have a safe place to meet and talk about difficult conversations. And then the very last opportunity just emerged a couple of weeks ago with the United Church that had suddenly lost one of its ministers. We offered some support and prayer. Some exciting things are beginning to happen in a bit of a whirlwind as we examine some possibilities of um, ministry and working with God's endless possibilities that are out there uh, in a way that's surprising to both of us. And to conclude, we're beginning to realize we need to make a mind shift. And that is based on what the World Council of Churches policy called the Lund Principle is all about. That principle affirms that churches should act together in all matters except for those in which deep differences of conviction compel them to act separately. In other words, instead of partnering together only in what you cannot do separately, we need to entertain a paradigm shift in which we do separately only what we cannot do together. Thank you.